Hello and welcome to History Hack. Matt here and I'm very excited today because I've got to oh, one of my favorite authors and one of my favorite people with me here today as well. So Merrin, how are you? I'm fabulous as always and also quite agitated, quite quite appreciative of the guest in the room, the, the virtual room as it, is, as it were. Um, welcome, Roland. How are you? I'm really well. Thanks so much for uh, for having me on the show. That's all right. You're very welcome. We, we're going to have a very belated chat about Harrier 809 today, which is out in paperback, hopefully around about the time everybody hears this. But before we get to that, how has lockdown been for you? Because that's our normal starter for 10 on, on these things, because it's most people say the same thing. But let's see what you have to say about it. <laughs> Well, we're deep into lockdown now, aren't we? I, I was just saying earlier, I, I'm sort of feeling increasingly deranged um, and sort of institutionalised as well. I'm sort of so used to these four walls, which, uh, you know, just over a year ago was something of a sort of sanctuary. You know, this is where I came to, to write and got away from, um, you know, the day job and the commute yeah. and, and all of that. And so it was somewhere I sort of retreated to, um, whereas it's now become unbelievably uh, sort of familiar and, and has been uh, a place into which the day job has, um, you, you know, necessarily intruded. And, uh, you know, so th that, that's been a, a change. And it's also, I mean, the lockdown has un undoubtedly had an effect on my ability to, to carry out the plans I had a year ago with respect to the publishing and the writing. You know, initially the the hope was to follow Harrier 809 quite quickly with a book uh, about um, 617 Squadron uh, flying tornadoes in the mid 80s. And, and I'd done a lot of the interviews for that, a lot of the legwork in terms of documentary um, research. And uh, there were a number of second interviews and things I wanted to try and do over summer. And that, alongside the delay to uh, Harrier 809 as a result of COVID, meant that that idea sort of had to be pushed to the right. And instead, I had to think of what I, I might be able to do during lockdown. Um, and that's turned into a book uh, about a mosquito raid during the Second World War. So that's not without its challenges in terms of the research, um, you know, getting to archives is no, <laughs> certainly no easier um, uh, during lockdown. Um, but it, but because there, there aren't the people who are involved to speak to and interview, mm. um, I've been able to do quite a lot using um, secondary sources instead. So, you know, hopefully I'll be writing that uh, this Christmas, um, having used my time profitably. As, as time goes on, it's going to become harder and harder to, to make that connection to the past, isn't it? Oh, yeah, undoubtedly. I mean, the, uh, kicking, kicking straight off, I think a lot of people don't realise that 809 is, was not a new outfit by the time we sort of start to dig into their their exploits in the Falklands, was it? No. Um, 809 no. Squadron was 1941. Yeah. And yeah. it was stationed at Royal Naval Air Station St. Merrin in Padstow in Cornwall. And uh, how uh, rarely do I get to see my uh, own name in print like that? Well, Merrin... <laughs> I, 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 I'm very, very pleased that you've spotted that Easter egg that was um, obviously in there in, just to secure my place on History Hack. <laughs> um, yeah, they, that's right. They formed um, in the 40s as a flying Fulmars, um, first of yeah. all, and got, I mean, they, you know, they really got mauled um, when they were flying in support of the, the sort of Norwegian campaign you know, up near Archangel. Um, by much uh, much more capable German single seat fighters, um, yeah, but I mean they did they subsequently flew sea uh, fires, um, which you know despite being a bit fragile, um, were obviously effective once they're in the air, and uh, then had a sort of rather illustrious post-war history as well, um, culminating in in being a buccaneer unit uh, aboard. Uh, Ark Royal in her sort of last incarnation as a big strike carrier Rich. carrying phantoms and buccaneers and gannets and sea kings and Some, somebody and wrote a really good book uh, about that oh yes uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean I, I yeah I couldn't resist uh exploring that either I mean you know I grew up in the 70s and and Ark Royal was the subject of that sort of landmark documentary mm series uh with the the rod stewart soundtrack so it really captured my imagination then um and it was really it's actually um on the back of that book about 809 as a buccaneer squadron that i was introduced to tim gedge who subsequently went on to be 
the squadron boss of 809 during the Falklands War. Um, and I'd mentioned then, I mean, almost 10 years before I got to grips with um, the Harrier story, that I was really keen on, uh, on, on tackling it, on exploring it. But it, it took me, as I say, 10 years to finally get there. And it was, it was actually the announcement that 809 was going to be the first F-35B uh, Lightning yeah. Squadron for the Fleet Air Arm that was the final kind of tipping point um, to get me uh, to sort of really go for go for the, the Falkland story. And you, as I mentioned, 617, there's, there's a, the, the idea is that they're two loosely connected um, books, both ending with uh, um, the F-35B at um, Marham with, in the shape of 617 and 809. Because we're, we're all about the same age, I think, um, roughly. Matt looks much younger than me. He looks, he looks, Matt looks younger than everybody. I, I look older than most people, don't worry. I, it, I have to credit my wife. She's, she's got me moisturising during lockdown, so I must have been bad. But do, do you remember uh, what I'm holding oh. up is the, the ubiquitous Marshall Cavendish weekly yeah. Falklands War compendium. Yeah. Now, now I, I grew up, I was, no, we are about the same age, yeah. so I was 82, I was, what, 11, 12 years old? Yeah, we're, we're almost exactly the same age, yeah. Mary, and, and I mean, um, that, that, that Marshall Cavendish thing, that's a proper kind of, that's bragging rights there. That's bragging rights, that is. Yeah. I would never, ever get rid of it. It's one of those things I've lugged around from house to house yeah. to house going, well, I'm never going to look at it. And now suddenly, suddenly with all of the our generation actually looking back and wanting to make the connection to these stories and understand about a bit more about what happened suddenly this this is this is primary yeah. material this that's is. amazing and that i've got a feeling that that picture on the front of that um is also the really iconic one that time magazine put on the front of um, their issue with the headline the empire strikes back that's it uh, with during the the jump. yeah 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 yeah, yeah. So, so, I mean, tell us, what, what was the fleet air arm situation as the task force sailed south? Bring us up to speed where we are. Well, I mean, the Navy more broadly um, was feeling very sort of bruised and underappreciated um, in 1982. They had, uh, I mean, you know, which was not uh, uncommon. They had, though, in uh, through John Knott's round of, of cuts, suffered further uh, slashes uh, and had only just managed to persuade him not to uh, to also scrap the two um, assault carriers, um, Intrepid and Fearless. Since 1966, uh, felt that they had essentially lost out to the RAF. They'd lost the, uh, the a replacement for Ark Royal through they believed um, you know the, the deceit and the lies of the RAF. But the RAFs had also lost um, the TSR two and the F-111 that it believed uh, were going to do the job of the strike carriers. Mm. So they were both sort of stiff, really, but um, that, that sort of bitterness and sort of sense of injustice uh, cut pretty deep in the fleet air arm. The existence of a fixed wing fleet air arm was really only um, preserved through the existence of the Harrier and the realization in the 70s that um, with a new generation of command and control ships for this the sort of the role that the navy was uh, going to be adopting as a sort of anti-submarine task force in support of nato in the northern atlantic there would be an opportunity with these this new class of cruisers uh, to fly not just helicopters but potentially vertical takeoff and landing jets which might at the very least be something that could deter Soviet patrol airplanes, which would be used for sort of locating the the um, the, the NATO ships, so they they were really there to do a job which the Navy describes as um, uh, hacking the shad, uh, hacking the shadower, um, rather than being sort of fleet interceptors like a like an F four Phantom, and they were very very small in number. You know, in mm -hmm. 1982. The Navy still had Hermes, which had been laid down um, as HMS Elephant, actually, during the Second World War. Uh, it's a relatively um, substantial carrier. And they'd just got new into service Invincible, the first of three ships. But she'd already been essentially sold to uh, Australia. Uh, and Illustrious was going to be coming into service along with um, Ark Royal. So, they, you know, the Navy felt uh, as if it was um, fighting for survival and relevance, I suppose, or, or certainly attention and respect from the government who, who it felt failed to appreciate the job it did. 
I think one of my new heroes from your book is Tim Gage. You mentioned him a bit earlier before, and he's given a bit of an impossible task because he was in an interesting meeting when he had a tap on the shoulder to, to go see the boss, wasn't he? What was he learning about well, at the time? Yeah, they, I mean, his, uh, his boss was actually briefing a whole lot of people on the Navy redundancy package. Um, you know, with fewer ships, there were going to be fewer officers and sailors. Um, and so he was there uh, while his uh, boss, um, Flag Officer Fatilla III, um, uh, an admiral called Sir Derek Reffel, was uh, explaining how the redundancy was going to work. He sort of heard about the Falklands uh, for the first time while that was all um, going on and was asked to go to Northwood and report to uh, permanent joint headquarters there on um, what if the, the task force was going to sail and they I mean ridiculously they um, said it was too classified to even tell him where a task force might go despite BBC reports of um, an Argentinian invasion of the Falklands being imminent um, he said well you know assuming it is the Falklands we'd sail both Hermes and Invincible and between them we could split 20 sea harriers 12 on Hermes uh, and eight on um, on Invincible, and that that was that was the entire frontline Harrier Sea Harrier force. And Tim had, until just two months earlier, been commanding officer of 800 Naval Air Squadron, which was the very first frontline um, Sea Harrier squadron um, in in operation, um, which followed Sharky Ward's uh, 700A uh, intensive flying trials unit. Um, so, you know, Tim was uh, uh, very experienced or as experienced as anyone there um, as a Sea Harrier um, a pilot and squadron commander, but had felt that he, you know, he had just literally missed the boat um, in terms of relinquishing command of that squadron and, and, and could see from Fort Southwark where he was bot uh, on Portsdown Hill where he was stationed. Um, he could actually see the carriers sailing out of Portsmouth and just sort of thought, you know, I can't believe my squadron's going to war and, you know, I'm the only, not, only one not going with them. So, so double bubble question here based on what people knew, because I've, I've heard a rumour that the press had um, a press release ready and waiting so that if it happened, if, um, if a Harrier could take down an Argentine 707, yeah. they already knew what they were going to say. Yeah. So, no. so the, the, the press was, was ahead of the game before we went south. Well, uh, I wouldn't, we're sort of jumping ahead a little bit with that. It, um, in that, 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 that press release wasn't written and ready to go until the amphibious task force sailed. Okay. So certainly Sea Harriers from uh, Hermes and Invincible uh, intercepted the Argentine 707s that were tracking the progress of the initial task group uh, under Sandy Woodward. Okay, so, so the other half of the question is, did yeah. any of the pilots know what they were in for? And where did they come from, actually? Uh, I suppose, I mean, they knew what they were in for insofar as they were able, as any uh, fighter pilot would uh, on their way to war, uh, they were able to uh, do due diligence into the capabilities of their, their opponents. Um, they also knew what they were in for in that for the last, um, since the Sea Harrier had, in, had entered service with 800 and then subsequently 801, uh, and uh, Sharky Ward went from 700A um, to uh, 801 to, be, to command the second Sea Harrier uh, frontline squadron. Um, you know, they'd spent two years fighting against pretty much every frontline NATO fighter uh, available and acquitting themselves incredibly well, much to the surprise mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, American Air Force pilots flying, uh, you know, the shiny new F-16, which was supposed to be a sort of unbeatable dogfighter and designed for dogfighting and nothing else uh, by the sort of US Air Force fighter mafia under John Boyd. But, you know, the, the Sea Harrier showed them a sort of clean pair of heels uh, and, um, and earned respect from those F-16 pilots from the, the aggressors based at um, the US bases here in, in, in the UK, from F-15 pilots flying, uh, flying in from American Air Force squadrons in Germany. Um, they all wanted to fly against the Sea Harrier. And um, you know, when Tim first met uh, an F-16 squadron that had just won a bombing competition up in, um, I think, Lucas or Lossimouth, I, I can't remember, one of the two Scottish fighter bases, 
they were very sort of disdainful of the Sea Harrier, this um, new uh, jet um, that had been developed from a, a 60s, um, initially a 60s design mm. um, that was subsonic, um, had these enormous kind of elephant ear jet intakes, uh, sort of funny little sort of outrigger uh, undercarriage. Um, apparently uh, a wing sort of too small for hard manoeuvring, you know, they, they, they didn't rate its chances and yet... It's got, um, it, it's got some weird it, nicknames. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, you know, a couple of, uh, a, a week later, um, the Telegraph was um, printing photographs of F-16s in the gun sites of, uh, of Sea Harriers. And, you know, what, what uh, Tim Gedge and, and 800 Squadron were able to do, Sharky Ward sort of doubled down on um, and, uh, you know, proved beyond doubt that the Sea Harrier was in the hands of the fleet air armed pilots, um, an extremely capable dogfighter. You, you've got a group there, and Andy Old, Sharky Ward, Tim Gedge, who were Harrier evangelists, weren't they? They were the right men to, to, to have to prove this aircraft that did even despite that still had a question mark over it because it it wasn't yeah. it wasn't what people kind of wanted in, in no i mean it, it, and it was untested um you know it hadn't gone to war you know those who flew it whether they were in the raf or the u.s marine corps um and obviously from uh, from 1979 the, the royal navy as well uh knew that they had um a remarkable airplane um, but as you say, Matt, it, it wasn't what people wanted. People wanted, um, you know, a big twin engine, supersonic, uh, heavily armed jet um, that could sort of do everything as it happened. I mean, the Sea Harrier uh, was pretty much able to do everything um, and more and more later in its in its operational life. Um, but, you know, there was enormous amount of resistance to it, even in, in the fleet air arm um, in the 70s, when it looked like it was first going to be the replacement for the Phantoms and the Buccaneers. And so much so that John Farley, who was the Sea Harrier, sea Harrier test pilot, um, was sent up to talk to some of these um, Phantom and Buccaneer pilots um, and tell them, look, you're, you know, you're not going to get a big shiny F-14 Tomcat to replace your Phantoms. Um, this is what you're getting. And if you approach it with an open mind, you might discover it's a good deal more capable than you imagined. And, I, and yet I don't think the Argentinians uh, underestimated it. I mean, I, you know, that they were not, um, you know, they were professional, capable, skillful flyers who had the disadvantage of not being able to train against um, allied peers. You know, I mean, the Sea Harriers got to fly against uh, the American Air Force, the French Air Force, the Italians, the Germans. Um, and test their metal and uh, test and develop tactics against the very best pilots in, in the world. And the Argentinians, for all their skill uh, and, uh, and knowledge and bravery, uh, were not able to do the same. And they were also well aware uh, that the Sea Harriers were going to come south armed with the uh, latest version of the Sidewinder missile. Uh, which was described by one of the engineering team that uh, had developed it as a, as a death ray. You know, so lethal was it uh, in comparison to earlier generations of, uh, of sidewinders that it offered um, potentially massive advantage. There are some great stories about sidewinders too. We'll come back to that. Mm. We can start confusing people with nine <laughs> Lima and nine Kilo. No, I was, I was just going to say, we're, we're, um, you mentioned it's subsonic. Do, do you want to just detail us? You fill in some of the details on the spec of the Sea Harrier. Well, I try, yeah. So um, uh, obviously, I mean, pretty much the most important part, I think, uh, of the Sea Harrier's design is that, you know, like the Harrier, it was designed around an engine. You know, exactly. It, it was designed around an engine, and it was designed around an engine which offered potentially the simplest uh, and uh, ultimately most effective way of turning thrust into lift. Um, by rotating those novels, nozzles, you could point all your jet thrust down and, and take off vertically. Um, but the critical uh, part of that equation is that you have to have more jet thrust than you have mass. Because if, if your thrust isn't greater than your mass, you can't take off vertically. You're just going to be stuck on the ground, even at full power. And so, yeah, unplanned, but obviously very welcome upshot of that was that the Sea Harrier had... Uh, excessive thrust to weight um, and one of the features of this new generation of fighters coming out of America like the F-16 uh, or the F-15 
was that they had this very high thrust to weight ratio because that meant that they could continue, they could turn much, much more tightly because they weren't going to stall. They had sufficient thrust to, to keep them going, keep them flying, even in a really, really tight turn. And you've got to bear in mind that that, uh, that thrust is critical because as the jet becomes heavier and heavier and heavier, um, you, know, you need more and more and more lift and eventually you're going to stall. Uh, even if you're, you know, stalling isn't just a question of raising your nose. It, it's about uh, the your wing's ability to create sufficient lift to keep you in the air. Um, and that's why you see the sort of angle of attack growing and growing as the plane slows down. It's trying to claw as much lift as it can uh, out, of, uh, out of a decreasing amount of speed. But a greater amount of thrust sort of allows you to overcome that to an extent. So we, we, we think of it as a, a jump jet, vertical takeoffs. Mm. Can it always take off vertically or does it, are, there, are there circumstances in which it actually needs momentum forwards as well? Well, M Merrin, you, you alluded to something earlier, which was this uh, possibility of launching um, Sea Harriers uh, to intercept Argentine 707s. And this is quite an interesting kind of uh, um, illustration, I suppose, of, of uh, the nuts and bolts of the question you're asking. So, of course, if you have got a fuel full, uh, a full fuel load um, and a fuel, a full a weapons load yes. and your gross weight is then greater than the amount of lift available to you from the engine you can't get off the ground but uh, with a short takeoff run so a little bit of lift from the wing and potentially a ski jump on the end of the carrier which um, sort of throws you into the air into a ballistic arc um, you can give yourself a sort of a, a bit of free money um, you get something for nothing going off that that ski jump. So you're just adding a little bit of lift um, and that that being thrown into the air off the um, uh, off, off the ski jump gives you a little bit of time where you're essentially sort of floating through the air like somebody throwing a cricket ball that just gives you time for the thrust to increase the speed and generate more uh, lift from your uh, from your wing. So it just gives you gives buys you time. What a leap of faith as a pilot. You're told this is going to work and you've got yeah. to go down just. It's a really, really rare. I mean, it is a it's a it's a leap of faith, but one based on the physics. And it's a, one mm. of those incredibly rare uh, instances of genuinely getting something for nothing, um, apart from possibly its impact on the elegant lines of your aircraft carrier. Um, but you know it, it's it's a free ride um, that ski jump in terms of uh, what it what it, it it gives you in terms of extra either extra fuel and consequently extra range extra weapons extra weapons and extra fuel it just means you've got uh, a lot more um, performance to play with um, but when you asked about the 707 and uh, one of the things when Atlantic conveyor was going south and and Atlantic Conveyor was the means by which 809 Squadron, which um, was the squadron Tim Gedge put together uh, after uh, uh, having seen his old squadron sail south on uh, Hermes and Invincible, um, went, went down from Ascension Island to the Falklands on Atlantic Conveyor. Um, they spotted a, a Sea Harrier um, on the helicopter pad at the front of um, Atlantic conveyor armed with a pair of sidewinders but no fuel tanks because it didn't have um, the, the thrust to be able to get airborne from vertically from that pad um, while it was carrying fuel tanks full of fuel so they just got rid of the fuel tanks completely so a pair of sidewinders and Tim Gage and his senior pilot Dave Braithwaite calculated that if they launched vertically from the pad at the front of Atlantic Conveyor, they'd be capable of making an interception as far as uh, 180 miles uh, away from, uh, from, from Atlantic Conveyor before getting back and, and potentially landing on vertically. But they were also um, supported in the possibility of doing that by Victor's flying out, RAF Victor tanker aircraft flying out of Ascension that, that might have been able to either provide them with extra fuel to land vertically uh, on conveyor or get them back to Ascension um, in extremis. But there was a there was a point where they were essentially beyond the range of those Victor's to, uh, to help them, uh, help support them if they had to launch, in which case the only way back would have been a vertical landing on on Atlantic conveyor and there were two occasions where they were they got into the cockpit expecting to scramble to uh, to intercept the, the 707 when um, 
when the order was eventually rescinded because i think there was certainly a, a suspicion um from both tim and dave as much as they both wanted to be the first pilot to launch a, a jet fighter vertically from the deck of a merchant ship to shoot down an enemy aircraft I mean, in a way that actually hadn't been done since the Second World War, when they were firing hurricanes and full Mars off the deck of merchant ships with sort of uh, catapults and rockets. Um, they both thought that potentially it was a one way trip. Um, I think it, it didn't need a lot to go wrong um, or for the sea state uh, to be such that it was going to be very tricky to get that Harrier back on the deck of um, Atlantic conveyor. The Harrier's maker, originally Hawkers, had some form in firing, <laughs> firing yeah. ships on merchants with rockets. Indeed, uh, yeah, they 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 did. I've I've got to I've got to work Hawkers into just uh, every. Well, we can talk about we we can talk about Hawkers because obviously you know the the Harrier and the Sea Harrier is quite evidently um, the same basic aeroplane. Um, was the last design uh, in the shape of the P eleven twenty seven, which was the first sort of Harrier shaped. Um, experimental prototype uh, that was overseen by Sir Sidney Cam, who uh, was uh, obviously the, um, the, the boss of, um, of Hawkers uh, through most of his existence up until that time and had overseen the design of the sort of wonderful um, sort of interwar biplanes, uh, you know, the Hind, the Hart, uh, the Hurricane, obviously the Typhoon, the Tempest, the Seahawk, the Hunter. I mean, you know, the, the Harrier was the uh, the last in the line of uh, some pretty thoroughbred fighters. Um, and, uh, you know, Sydney Cam was very, very sure of its um, flying qualities um, based on the fact that Hawker airplanes had excellent flying qualities. So he wasn't going to, wasn't going to hear anything otherwise. But the, the, because I mentioned the weight issue um, with vertical takeoff airplanes at the time that the, the Harrier was due to first fly, um, the Pegasus was a much less powerful engine, which the Pegasus was the name of this Rolls-Royce engine that sat in the middle of a Harrier, uh, than it became. And uh, it didn't really have the power to, um, to, to launch the Harrier vertically um, on its first flight. And they had to really strip a lot of bits and pieces off the airplane to, to fly it vertically for the first time. Um, so it was suggested to Sir Sydney that maybe they should um, make the first flight a conventional one um, just to sort of test its flying qualities. And, you know, Sir Sydney um, reacted angrily to say, you know, all Hawker airplanes fly excellently and there's absolutely no need to, uh, to test its flying qualities at all. And we're going to launch it vertically or not at all. And, and it did indeed have uh, exceptional flying qualities, the Harriet. Before we can get to Atlantic and Bear, we need a squadron. Yeah. And at one point, 809 is Tim Gedge and a clipboard, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're absolutely right. I mean, you know, Tim uh, first was asked to go to Northwood to brief them about the Sea Harriers um, prior to the invasion. Um, and uh, uh, on the afternoon that he'd seen the carriers sail, which was only uh, five days after the invasion, four days after the invasion, um, it, in a sort of remarkable uh, effort by the Navy um, to, to, to get them to sail. Um, he was uh, phoned by uh, a man called Admiral Ted Anson, uh, who was HMS Arkwell's last captain. He was said, you know, how do you fancy um, forming a new squadron, new Sea Harrier squadron? And, uh, you, know, you know, Tim was practically sort of jumping up and down with excitement about that prospect. Um, and uh, you know, said, you know, when, when, do you, when do you want me to start? He said, 8 a.m. tomorrow morning, be great. So he sort of drove down to Yeovilton, the headquarters of the Fleet Air Arm uh, and he, Fleet Arm Sea Harrier Force, and was told just to uh, be ready in three weeks. He said, he, he, you know, he had a carte blanche, he could do what he wanted. He could get Harriers from wherever he could find them, Sea Harriers from wherever he could find them, get pilots from wherever he could find them. All he needed to, to ensure was, was that he was going to be ready in three weeks' time. But of course, three weeks is nothing to put together you know, a modern frontline jet fighter squadron. Absolutely nothing. And, and as Matt's pointed out, uh, he didn't have any pilots uh, when he arrived. The first of them to, to, to join the squadron was a pilot called uh, David Austin, who was at the time running the Sea Harrier simulator um, at Yeovilton. Uh, former RAF Harrier pilot who, after 
flying for the sort of um, fleet requirements in air direction unit, hurry, uh, hunters and cameras, joined the fleet air arm uh, to fly uh, by Sea Harriers. And he, so he was in. Uh, he wasn't allowed to take a couple of the test pilots that he wanted to take who were Sea Harrier qualified. Uh, one of them, because uh, on the basis that because war hadn't been declared, uh, there was it wasn't legal to call up Royal Navy reservists. So uh, the most experienced Sea Harrier pilot in the country wasn't allowed to join 809. Uh, he pulled people back from exchange tours um, in Arizona. Uh, where um, Bill Covington was flying Harriers with the United States Marine Corps from California, where Dave Braithwaite was flying F-4s and Tomcats. And even I think he got to fly the, the F-18 Hornet as well with VX-4, which was the US Navy's test squadron. And he was having a whale of a time uh, punching holes in the air in Tomcats and, um, and F-4s. Uh, and then there was um, uh, Hugh Slade was brought back from Australia, where he was being trained as an air warfare instructor in Australian Navy A4 Skyhawks. And from one squadron RAF, which was um, uh, based in Wittering, another pilot, Al Craig, was brought back to the fleet air arm. But of them, um, only Hugh Slade, um, no, Hugh Slade and Dave, Bra Dave Braithwaite actually had Sea Harrier experience. So while Bill had been flying Harriers, um and al was flying harriers um they'd never flown the sea harrier and, and while they're broadly similar in terms of flying qualities they're subtly different particularly uh, in in the hover I, I i understand where there's stronger puffer jets on the which things that keep you stable in the, the hover on the harrier in the sea harrier um and of course they weren't familiar with the avionics the radar the weapon system the navigation system that the sea harrier um, had but they were still short of pilots, even with these people dragged back to, to these naval pilots dragged back to Yeovilton. Um, and so they cast the net a little wider amongst the RAF's Harrier squadrons. And they found two pilots um, at three squadron um, in Germany, uh, Gutteslow, who had previously had single seat fighter experience flying the Lightning. Um, and so not only were they current on the Harrier or vertical takeoff um, uh, airplanes, uh, but they also had some understanding uh, and training in in, in air defence through flying the um, th through flying the the Lightning, and so John Leeming and Steve Brown were uh, put on a plane and flown back to Yeovilton. But this by by this time we were sort of ten days into the time the the training period. So uh, Steve Brown and and John Leeming only I think only flew a Sea Harrier for the first time about ten days before they deployed. Um, and um, you know, rather than a sort of nine-month conversion course uh, to 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 fly the fly the Sea Harrier, they had ten days uh, to try and sort of get to grips with it all, and uh, and and actually only about ten hours in the cockpit. So, so I've, I've got a question which is completely born of ignorance. If I get out of a Toyota Land Cruiser and get into a Saab, it's a car, it's got a steering mm. wheel, it's got you know, I'm there, I can yeah. do it. If I get out of a Lightning and get into, and this is the early 80s, so we're not talking high tech, high tech, we're talking mm -hmm. some element of analog, surely. Mm -hmm. Is yeah. is it all immediately transferable? Can you can you actually get out of one cockpit, get into another, and go? Okay, I'm pretty sure I'm not going to crash it. Well, I mean that was the uh, the the reason for bringing pilots with Harrier experience because the Harrier. Uh, it, is I mean I was going to say particularly unique. It's I mean that's that's obviously a tautology, but I mean the Harrier is unique. You know the, the, there's nothing else that fly that can do what the Harrier does, okay. and so no, you could you absolutely could not have put a Lightning pilot in the cockpit of a Harrier and said you're going to have to land vertically on a right. on an aircraft okay, carrier. Yeah. But you could take a Harrier pilot uh, who had prior experience flying air defence in a Lightning and have them fly a Sea Harrier, which is a fighter aeroplane, with some understanding of, of how to conduct um, uh, air defence and, and fighter operations because of their experience flying the, the Lightning. So, you know, it's that vertical takeoff and landing component that is, is, that is additional. You know, you've got an extra lever in the cockpit of a Harrier or a Sea Harrier that you do not have uh, in a Lightning or a Phantom, or indeed any other frontline jet fighter which controls the rotation of the, the jet nozzles. 
um, up or down. So, so the, the jet, your jet thrust is either pointing down or backwards. And, and you know, you, both of those levers have to be operated with your left hand. I mean, it, it, it's, um, you know, it involves quite a, quite a lot of dexterity. I'm not a pilot. I, I, I'm, I'm sort of conveying all of this on the basis of what I have read and on the basis of having spoken to them. But it does strike me that it's a fairly superhuman feat of coordination to, to have to pull off. Um, and, um, you know, it, it doesn't surprise me that Harrier pilots uh, had a reputation um, for letting people know quite quickly that they were Harrier pilots. It was the joke. Now, how, do, how, do you, how, do you, how do you know if somebody's a Harrier pilot? They'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I find, I find <laughs> drummers, drummers, find, it, it's a coordination thing. I'm sure it is. Polymath drummers, they'll all tell you what they do. I was quite fortunate to get a to go to Dunsfold while the last batch of um, FA2s were being were being assembled, and they let us sit in the cockpit of of one, which was which was great. This was a school trip; it was brilliant. And it's quite interesting that when you know when the nozzles are sort of pointed for for lift for vectoring, and when they're in, in its normal back position, it's it's quite away from the throttle. Wonderfully ergonomically designed. And then when you're sort of going into viffing, which I'm sure we'll talk about later, they are quite close to each other, so it's a quite a but it's it's it is completely different and then, and then of course which i suppose we won't get to it gets too geeky because the, the difference is from a gr1 which is designed for ground attack to a sea harrier which is designed for air defense and air interception is quite thing the, the, the radar being the main one which is why you want that that pilot yeah. who's got inter intercept experience because it's that is not something that you can pick up particularly mm -hmm. quickly and that, that was really the main challenge. It wasn't the nuts and bolts of flying the Harrier. It was familiarity with the weapon system and the navigation. Um, and um, you know that was the thing which John Leeming and Steve Brown coming from a GR3, which has no radar. And at the time that they left the squadron was not wired to fire A9L Sidewinder missiles, had to get, had to, get to grips with. And now firing as Sidewinder is not, a, I don't think, as as most fighter pilots would tell you, a particularly difficult thing. I mean, this is the the, the nature of the Sidewinder is that it does the work for you um, by having the seeker head in the in the nose. It's not something that you have to kind of aim and then control to its target yourself. Um, but at the same time, you do have to uh, be familiar with the sort of switchery required to arm it and fire it. And as John Leeming found when he was uh, uh, down south, uh, he'd forgotten how to do it in the heat of heat of battle. Uh, you know, in the middle of a dogfight, he just wasn't able to get his sidewinder to fire. And fortunately, he remembered how to switch to guns, and so he gunned down a Skyhawk that he was chasing down instead. Uh, but um, you know, that that really is just a quite a vivid illustration of the lack of familiarity that uh, those those pilots drafted into 809 had with the Sea Harrier's systems, avionics weapon systems. That must have been so frustrating for John because when it's locked on, it screeches in your headphones. Mm. Yeah. So it's, it's a tone as opposed to much yeah. coming up. And that must, him looking for the right button must, with yeah. that noise going on in his headset. Exactly. No, I mean, he, yeah, he, he knew he'd got the missile locked on. He just, you know, he was trying, trying to press everything, but, but nothing worked. And it was, it was actually after he'd shot down the Skyhawk and was um, on his way back to the carrier that he had this kind of oh no moment where he sort of started to started to figure out what had gone wrong. And I, 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 prior to having it confirmed when he got back to the carrier that there was nothing wrong with the the missiles, he'd just forgotten, the, figured out how to um, fire them. Uh, he he can come to the same conclusion himself, um, sort of flying back. Um, so I think it's slightly embarrassed, but that was... Um, for all the ribbing that that, that attracted, uh, it was compensated for by the fact that he had just scored a, a, a guns kill, which is uh, kind of pretty, pretty unusual, and and also survived flying through the debris crowd cloud that it it created. I mean, you know, he wasn't hundred yards off the back of this Skyhawk when it sort of um, uh, disintegrated. Right, Atlantic conveyor time, mainly because I want to talk about Ian North, mm -hmm. Atlantic conveyor's skipper who. When someone walks up to you saying, right, we want to take your container ship and basically change it into an aircraft carrier, you think most most skippers would be a bit adverse to that, but he seems to have gone, right, let's do it. Yeah. And and they just cracked on because he had he had quite a quite a cargo and like 
we'll we'll come come to yeah. what happens, I suppose. But he he seems an amazing character. He's he, he's a remarkable character, and for reasons that um, you know will become apparent, um, I I wasn't able to talk to him. Although he uh, he equally he he would have been very old by now because he was a he was a, a sort of boy sailor um during the second world war uh flying the uh, flying or uh, sailing on the merchant ships uh with the atlantic convoys i mean you know he was he was war weary and um proven in battle uh, uh, as a sort of resilient and unflappable character i mean he he had his ship had been sunk from underneath him certainly a couple of times during second world war and i think possibly more than that but he had gone on subsequently to become one of cunard's uh most experienced tried and trusted uh, skippers who was often drafted in to prove the first in class of any new uh, um, freighter any new cargo ship and that was true of the uh, the class of of um, fast uh, roll-on roll-off ferries uh, container ships that um, Atlantic conveyor came from so he he had sort of proven that that class uh, he'd also set uh, records with and, and had has a golden staff i think or golden uh baton of some sort in his uh cabin on on board atlantic convey which he'd, he'd won for being the first ship to make it down the hudson uh after the um, ice had melted and that was a i mean it was a sort of hair i mean it was quite a lot of source store set by this achievement i gather and uh, it involves some particularly sort of uh, ballsy ship driving over sort of shallow water on the outside of a curve to overtake his main rival. When you think he's doing that in a sort of 20,000 ton freighter, it's clear that you've got somebody who is, you know, nerveless. And so probably, uh, if not unconcerned, um, certainly reasonably sanguine about the job of um, skippering a hastily converted container ship into a war zone and uh, that you know that's exactly what happened he, he became firm friends with his naval counterpart captain michael layard who subsequently went on actually to become second sea lord mike layard was former naval fighter pilot was was uh, going to become station commander at Royal Naval Air Station Culled Rose and was just waiting to take up that appointment when the Falklands War intervened. Um, and uh, he was asked to become senior naval officer on board Atlantic Conveyor. So he and Ian North, who was the, um, the master of Atlantic Conveyor, her civilian captain, formed a sort of partnership um, and became firm friends very quickly in the, uh, the sort of 30-day... Uh, career enjoyed by uh, Atlantic Conveyor. She was you know, hastily converted. She sailed down from Liverpool to um, Devonport Dockyard. She was hastily converted there, whereby uh, they sort of stripped a lot of the, the ironmongery off the deck of the, the ship. Um, they kept a couple of um, rows, a, a couple of a row on either side of containers to provide a little bit of protection for the cargo that was going to sit on deck. Um, a, a helicopter pad at the front of the ship and a helicopter pad at the back of the ship. And then they loaded her with, in the UK, Chinooks and another squadron of Wessex um, helicopters that was also uh, recommissioned for the, uh, for the Falklands reinforcements. And at Ascension, six Royal Air Force Harriers um, and the eight Sea Harriers uh, worked up in that sort of intensive three week period of uh, 809 Squadron, who sailed, who flew to Ascension via um, the Gambia um, and embarked on the, the ship while she was there at, um, at, uh, at Ascension. Then they sailed south on Atlantic Conveyor with the Amphibious Task Group, which carried, um, well, sort of led by Fearless um, and with Intrepid in tow, um, her sister ship, that, that were carrying uh, the soldiers and Royal Marines of uh, the Three Commando Brigade and the, the two and three para who were going to be the troops that were landed ashore um, at San Carlos. So while it was the job of Invincible and Hermes to sort of secure the skies uh, and the seas indeed with the submarines there around the Falkland Islands, it was the job of the soldiers and Royal Marines on board uh, the ships of that amphibious task group to actually retake the Falkland Islands and Atlantic Conveyor with 809 Squadron and one Squadron RAF sailed south as part of that task group. One of the things that struck me 
with with reading Herrera and Nine Roland was it, it's it's very rounded. You spend quite a bit of time with the Argentine forces as well, mm. and these were not inexperienced chaps. These were no. hardened pilots who who would put up a, a a very a very good front, but also were had their own had their own troubles as well because they they were not exactly well financed themselves. We think of the John Knott review. Argentina yeah. was in a pretty poor state. They were. I mean, they had a large fleet of uh, of fast jets in the form of uh, Mirages, Daggers, which were the Israeli-built version of the, sort of the ground attack Mirage. They only had actually a very small number of Mirage fighters. Um, they had ground attack Daggers, which lacked the radar that the, the fighters, the Mirages had. And they had Skyhawks in the Air Force and in the Argentine Navy. And the Argentine Navy had also very, very recently had delivered uh, Super Etendard, which was the, the French Navy's frontline attack jet, which was, I mean, in some respects comparable to the Harrier without the, um, the uh, vertical takeoff ability in that it was essentially a 1960s airframe, which had been updated with um, modern avionics and a modern attack radar navigation system, weapon system that allowed it to fly in all weathers. But most importantly, from the point of view of uh, it, the threat it posed to the British, uh, it carried the Exocet missile, which was potentially the greatest threat that there was to the success of the British uh, operation. Um, and certainly that was a view held by uh, Sandy Woodward. Um, the Exocets and the Super Etondars flown by the Argentine Navy had the potential, had the, the ability to uh, remove one or both of the carriers uh, from the British effort. And Sandy Wood was always very clear that he could potentially continue the operation with Hermes alone if Invincible was damaged or sunk. But if Hermes was sunk, the British would simply have to pack up and go home because those carriers were, they, they were the vital and irreplaceable part of that uh, whole operation. Without the air defense provided by the sea harriers flying from the carriers, um, the Falklands, the, 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 the operation to retake the Fal Falklands, Operation Corporate, was a non-starter. Mm. I mean, as subsequently has been said by a number of people, not least the then, Mar the then first sea lord sir henry leach but also uh, margaret thatcher you know without the harriers without the sea harriers uh, the falklands could not have been retaken and so protecting those carriers from attack by uh etondars super etondars was absolutely critical it's why they had to be stationed so far to the east and why the sea harriers as a result didn't have a great deal more time in terms of the fuel that they had over the islands than the argentines flying 300 miles from mainland argentina did over the falklands both were operating kind of at the the, the sort of extent of their uh, useful range but uh, just going back to the the super super and the the, the exocet as matt said you know the the people flying these jets were extremely experienced, extremely capable, and perhaps not too experienced in the Aton Dark because it was so new into service, but they had all previously earned their spurs flying uh, ship attack in the uh, in the A4 Skyhawk. Now, they were uh, capable, skilled, and courageous pilots. And interestingly, I um, I got an email about, uh, about so three or four weeks ago, completely out of the blue, from uh, a man in Canada um, who uh, had just read Harrier 809 and uh, wanted to drop me a line to make a couple of um, corrections. Um, and um, I sat up and listened because it turned out that uh, he was the pilot who sunk Atlantic Conveyor. And Atlantic Conveyor, when she was sunk by an Exocet missile, by two Exocet missiles actually fired by a pair of Super Etondars, was only 10 miles away from HMS Hermes, only 10 miles away from the carriers. So in, in that attack, and uh, this is, that, that, that attack was the, um, the tragic um, episode that saw Ian North lose his life uh, when a uh, uh, conveyor was abandoned. Um, you know, that attack demonstrated beyond any doubt at all that the carriers for all the layered air defenses that the British fleet used the Sea Harriers on the outside, the CDAR, long range Sea Dart missile inside of that, and inside of that, um, the Sea Wolf, and then uh, you've got sort of uh, chaff to try to deflect um, the missile's progress as well. 
those ships were not entirely safe. You know, we could improve their chances of survival, but those Super 8 and DARS proved that they could get through uh, by, you know, cleverly uh, using the air refueling capability provided by the Argentine Air Force. They could come in from directions that were not where they were expected to come in from. And really, with only tw 20 Sea Harriers protecting your, uh, your, your ships, and this was why the, the, there was an urgent need for the eight reinforcements uh, provided by 809. Um, so the, the, the maximum number of Harriers we ever, Sea Harriers we ever had was 25, um, because three had been lost before 809 even arrived in theatre. They just couldn't protect you around 360 degrees. You know, they had to be pointing in the direction of the threat to the to the west. You know, they'd be covering an arc. But if a Super 8 on Dark got in behind that, um, you know, you could try and uh, uh, meet them with a Sea Harrier. But that was always going to be um, uh, hope rather than expectation that you'd ever catch them. We, we only had 25 um that that was the maximum we were. is there any truth to the rumor that we were actually trying to sell sea harriers to the argentines just prior? yeah i mean it's not a rumor at all uh, we we were desperate to sell them sea harriers um and uh, you know there's some there's some fantastic exchanges in the the national archives between the ministry of defense and the the foreign office with a foreign office uh, arguing that um you know they, they, they didn't really see how a, how the sea harriers if the argentines were um were, were to acquire them could play any useful role in um, in, a, an, in a, an attack on the Falkland Islands. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we had tried to sell them Harriers before that. And indeed, they, you know, they were really keen to buy them. Um, we landed, uh, John Farley actually landed on the Argentine aircraft carrier the 25th of May. Um, I won't even begin to try a Spanish accent uh, or indeed Spanish. Spanish for 25th of May is the actual name of the, the Argentine carrier. As she was sailing from uh, from the Netherlands, where she had previously been in service with the uh, the, the Dutch Navy, uh, back to Argentina, off the south coast of the UK, uh, John Farley landed a Harrier um, on, uh, on, on that ship. And actually prior to them acquiring that ship, uh, the head of the Argentine Navy, um, had even asked uh, his British equivalent, Royal Navy equivalent, whether or not they could have Hermes. I mean, you know, Hermes was, they actually wanted to buy her. And so in, in the end, uh, rather than acquiring the Sea Harrier, uh, the Argentines bought the, um, the Super Etondar. You know, they, they were, uh, you know, e equivalent in terms of their age and sophistication. They were very, very similar aeroplanes in lots of ways. You know, the Royal Navy pilots frequently trained um, with their French counterparts and uh, well as they frequently trained with their French counterparts until Argentina invaded the Falklands and that's then suddenly the French said actually you can't train uh, against the Super, super 8 on Dars anymore in, in terms of those direct conversations between the British squadrons and their French counterparts it, in fact they did um, and they wanted to keep this very secret so that it, it, it didn't have any impact on their, their ability to sell aeroplanes and missiles to prospective enemies of the British. They did actually allow the RAF and Navy pilots to practice known as dissimilar air combat training uh, against both Mirage fighters and Super 8 on Dars um, prior to 809's departure um, south. They, they flew a Mirage into uh, RAF Coningsby and under the auspices of something called Project Typhoon, which was actually a, a long-term agreement to train train uh, pilots together without, I don't think it actually landed, um, but they flew uh, um, a Super 8 on Dar up, up from the French base in Brittany as well. And they practiced um, combat training against the Harriers. So the French were, they were helpful. But as I, uh, as I discovered, actually from this Argentine Super 8 on Dar pilot, they were definitely quite helpful to the Argentines <laughs> as well, um, in terms of helping them get their, um, their super their um, Eton Dars um, firing Exocet missiles. I thought it was keeping your options open, isn't it? Yeah, really? yeah, 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 exactly. Um, yeah, yeah. Friends to everyone. Yeah. What What happens next when, when 809 gets down is, is fascinating because they, they arrive and you have two very tired squadron commanders. But mm. I'm actually going to say buy the book and find out what happens when 809 arrives because it's 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 not the twist you'd be expecting 
Yeah, it's 809 proved to be the most useful vehicle for putting together the required reinforcements. It was just the most obvious and streamlined way of doing it and to present a, or create a sort of sense of uh, esprit de corps and camaraderie. But what happened uh, just a few days before they uh, reached um, the war zone was that, and it, it, I mean, there are a number of reasons for this. I mean, partly it's because I, there were eight of them and they were just simply too many to put on either one or the other of the carriers. But at the same time also, um, there were already two squadron commanders uh, on board Hermes in the shape of 899's boss. That's the headquarters and training squadron that had already re... I mean, I, I haven't actually mentioned before that each Sea Harrier squadron prior to the Falklands was actually only supposed to be five jets strong. Um, they were really small squadrons. So when they were reinforced uh, to deploy south aboard um, Hermes and Invincible. Invincible took eight, and it took three of 899, the training squadron, 899's jets, um, and uh, Hermes took 12, uh, again, reinforced by um, uh, jets from 899 squadron. But so, so Hermes had Neil Thomas and Andy Old, uh, Tim Gedge's replacement at, as 800 squadron, on there, two squadron commanders. Invincible only had one in the shape of Sharky Ward, who was 801's boss. So the decision was taken to split 809 between 800, between Hermes and Invincible, four jets on, on each carrier with a sort of slight feeling that because of Invincible's role as the lead ship for air defence, that the pilots there would perhaps have more experience on, on the air defence side of things, although that doesn't account for Steve Brown and and John Leeming, the, the lightning pilots necessarily having gone, gone to um, Hermes. But uh, so Dave Braithwaite, Tim Gedge, um, Al Craig and, um, and Hugh Slade went to, uh, went to uh, Invincible and the others went to, uh, went to Hermes. And on board Invincible, in fact, on board both ships, essentially the 809 became sort of subsumed within um, the extant squadron uh, on each of those ships. 800 simply became a bigger unit and 801 simply became a, a bigger unit. And while th there was a sort of um, a private rear guard action, which was, I, I mean, I suppose a sort of mixture of um, rebellion and diligence by Tim, Gard Tim, Tim Gedge, just to sort of maintain a, a separate record of what 809 was doing and 809's actions and uh, the, um, keep a log of the flights flown by um, 809 squadron, 809 pilots from Invincible. Essentially, they became part of 801's makeup and and uh, and, and under Sharky Ward's command. Roland, this has been great fun. It, for, for a book that suffered a massive delay last year when it came out, the reaction to it's been superb. I I, I, I got to geek out a bit because I got to read it early and then spend six months telling everyone, <laughs> this thing is coming, it's amazing. And, and, and I was very, very grateful for that, Matt. Your, uh, your enthusiasm for the book, honestly, at a time where uh, things were very uncertain, was a huge shot in the arm because I think you were one of the first people to read it. And um, uh, that, it kept me going through, uh, through the, what was a very unwelcome delay actually until the rest of the world got to uh, to see it and i was sort of it meant i could go through that six months not worrying about whether whether or not anyone was going to like it as at least one person liked it i had a hundred percent hit record hit, hit rate at that point it was it was that bloody book while we were in stockholm on our last trip before lockdown as i was just sitting in the car, another chapter another chapter <laughs> <laughs> but that's good that's good when, when a book really gets you like that and, and i think that it's something that it's worth pointing out that in in the annals if you're going to go to your bookshelf and, and pick up a technical manual or a technical interpretation of what happened in the fall this isn't that kind of book this is a readable book this is a narrative you get inside people's minds yeah. it's absolutely a really good read i have i've really tried to to bring that to life i mean it, it was not that you anyone listening to me trying to explain how um thrust lift and stalling work will think that it's going to get anything but probably but actually i, ha I really have tried to yeah. bring to life the human uh -huh. story and and it was interesting i mean it 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 became for me uh, in the end as much as it was a story about 809 squadron uh, a story about atlantic conveyor the sacrifice actually that 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 ship and and her small crew made in support yeah. of the of the task force that in the end was a story that I felt I felt very moved by. In North was clearly a remarkable character. He and the 12 members of Atlantic Conveyor's crew uh, lost their lives. 
and and as the sort of um, climax, in a way, of, uh, uh, of the Royal Navy's war with the Exocet missile, which had the potential, uh, until the, those rounds were expended, to end Britain's attempt to retake yeah. the Falklands War. As the climax of that story, uh, Atlantic Conveyor assumed a sort of greater and greater importance in my mind as I, I sort of worked on the book. And I, I mean, I really do hope I've, I've done her story justice as well. Very much so. I don't think anybody can help but be moved when they read the book. Roland, thank you so much for joining us. It's been an absolute privilege. Oh, thanks so much, Merrin. And uh, thank you, Matt, too. It's been a real pleasure talking to you. We'd like to thank Roland White for joining us on History Hack, and you'll be pleased to know that Harrier 809's paperback release has not been delayed, and it is out now and available, as you may guess, on our very own bookshop. Head to bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash history hack, and you can find your copy of 809 waiting for you there if for some reason you haven't already read it. 10% of every purchase goes to supporting the podcast, and we thank you so much for all the different ways you support us. Which means it's now time for the Patreon bit. In 2020, when the boss ladies Alex and Alina started History Hack, the world was very strange, and unfortunately, it looks like 2021 is going to be equally strange. We would love it if you're able to support the podcast in any way. It will allow us to keep up the regularity of the pods and also the great guests that we've been able to bring you over the last year. We exist on Patreon as History Hack and also on Podbean, our podcast host's own platform called Patreon. The reward tiers are being updated at the moment, so there's going to be some fantastic options for you to choose from. So if you're able to support us, that would be fantastic. So we thank you very much and until the next time.